Inequality is one of the biggest problems in our world today. But what exactly is inequality? How do we measure it? What other aspects of the economy affect it? Is it increasing or decreasing? In this video, I attempt to answer some of these questions, focusing on the impact that technological development has for inequality, using Chile as a case study. So, how unequal is the world right now? Well, there are two types of inequality, wealth inequality and income inequality. In terms of wealth inequality, although India and Africa conform 30% of the world's population, they only possess about 2% of the world's wealth. In terms of income inequality, this is what it would look like if we were to distribute $100 amongst 10 people according to the income distribution today. Although it does not look very fair, the situation has been improving in the last few years. This graph shows data from the OECD showing daily income per capita distribution since the 1800s. Although global income inequality increased for about two centuries, it is now falling. The overall distribution has shifted to the right, with the income of the world's poorest citizens increasing and poverty falling faster than ever before. Technology is one of the most relevant factors generally cited as a reason for the change in this distribution. Inequality is usually measured using the Gini index. The Gini index is a number from 0 to 1 calculated using the Lorentz curve and the equality line. A perfect score of 0 represents a society where all individuals have the same income, while a score of 1 represents a society where one individual accumulates all the wealth. But why is inequality such a huge deal? Well, for many reasons. Income inequality means some people have inequitable access to services like health and education. This distinction means that some part of the workforce does not develop to its full potential, making the country's income growth less than what it could potentially be. A second reason why inequality is important is because of the Easterling paradox, which shows that regardless of absolute increases on income, people's happiness doesn't increase unless inequality decreases. The paradox is explained by horizontal inequality, which refers to the human tendency to measure ourselves in relation to our neighbors and not in absolute terms. Let's now review the situations of three different countries with different Gini scores. This chart shows the gross domestic product, the Gini score, and the population levels of three different countries. Out of those three, Germany has both the highest GDP and the lowest Gini index, meaning that it is the most equal. Germany is a rich country, with the highest income per head of the EU's largest countries, comfortably ahead of Britain, France and Italy. Unemployment is the lowest in the EU. Labor shortages are actually one of Germany's biggest problems. However, as seen in the graph, Germany is also one of the most unequal developed countries. On household income, Germany is close to the European average, but on wealth, Germany is significantly less equal than its European peers. The bottom 40% of Germans have almost no assets at all, not even bank savings. Furthermore, income inequality is on the rise. The Financial Times reports that, as far as incomes are concerned, the gap between the poorest 10% of Germans and the richest tenth started widening in the mid-1990s. It did so largely for the same reasons as elsewhere in the developed world, globalization and the loss of jobs through technological change. On the other side of the spectrum are the Seychelles Islands, with a high score in the Gini index, and a very high GDP as well. Seychelles is the only African nation considered as a high-income country. This is largely because of its low population, which makes its GDP per capita very high. Most of Seychelles' income comes from a market-based diversified economy, with rising public sectors and tourism. However, despite the country's newfound economic prosperity, poverty remains widespread due to a high level of income inequality, one of the highest in the world. 
Economists deem the stark appearance of inequality very predictable. For many years, the government tried to keep the gap between the highest and lowest paid as narrow as possible. But command and control policies and laws in this regard contributed to economic stagnation. With the economic restructuring program and adoption of free market policies, the gap suddenly widened. The World Bank reports that in the Seychelles, the labor market is rewarding workers with technical and job-relevant skills, which are in scarce supply. Low-income jobs are also widely available because of the tourism industry. However, jobs for people in the middle class with medium levels of education are increasingly harder to find. This is called labor market polarization and has led to increased income inequality. This phenomenon is common in the global economy, and a lot of research has been done to establish strategies through which economic growth can help reduce income inequality instead of increase it. Given the relationship between technological development and economic growth, and the relationship between economic growth and income inequality, and the increasing trend on technological development, a lot of research has been done attempting to predict the impact that technological development will have on economic inequality. Clearly, no economist would argue that technological development is bad. First of all, it was thanks to technological development that we escaped the Malthusian trap a couple years ago after the Industrial Revolution. Technology increases efficiency and productivity, accelerating economic growth. It does so through the mechanisms of creative destruction, which Joseph Schumpeter defines as the incessant product and process innovation mechanism by which new production units replace outdated ones. Some people have expressed fear of humans being the next product to be replaced, and that the fast pace of the technological advancement will leave us all without jobs and lead to a global economic crisis. However, there have been multiple technological revolutions, including the agricultural, the industrial one, and most lately, the digital one. And as far as I know, we're still alive. This is not to say that economic advancement only brings benefits to our economy. Many authors have warned of the increasing economic inequality driven by the economic growth caused by technology. As we mentioned in the case of Germany, technologic development is one of the reasons most commonly cited to understand economic inequality increasing in developed countries. This is because of the polarization of jobs explained before. Wages are set based on employment rent, meaning the cost of losing a job. Technology has the ability to replace jobs that involve routinary tasks. These jobs are generally white-collar jobs taken by people in the middle sectors of the economy. Other low-wage jobs in the service sector that require human interaction and empathy are still available. Technology also creates new jobs, but these are usually only available for very high educated people, meaning the elite of the economy. Hence, technologic development forms a gap in job offers for the middle income class, increasing income inequality. However, there is one region in the world where income inequality is actually decreasing, Latin America. In order to understand the mechanisms behind this phenomenon, let's examine Chile. As this graph shows, Chile is a developed country with one of the highest income inequality rankings. This is true for both wealth and income inequality. It is also one of the few countries where income inequality is decreasing. Perhaps telling of the reasons behind this phenomenon is the fact that Chile is still behind in the technological revolution. Government spending on research and development is one of the lowest among developed countries. One of Chile's biggest sources of income is mining, especially through the copper industry. This has always been the case and is almost embedded in the Chilean culture. Mining is a very good industry for Chile because it generates jobs at both the high skill educational level and the low one. Chile is also the most centralized country in Latin America, as stated by the President of the Chamber of Deputies. This means that people in the regions don't have many options when it comes to labor. People in the northern regions of Chile mostly rely on mining. This means that although low-skill labor is very dangerous, most people choose to take it and rely on it to make a living. This scenario leaves residents of these regions highly vulnerable to development technologies that might replace their jobs. However, Chile is not advanced yet in these technologies, and most of the ones that have been implemented generate jobs of the same 
skill level. For example, aerial drones to survey the lands still need to be supervised by someone who knows about mining. Meanwhile, other industries like the service industry is still growing strong, providing more low-skilled labor and helping reduce the income gap. An example are the Pronto convenience stores owned by the petroleum company Copec. Chile's strong economy allows companies like this to open more stores, which employ more people. International economic growth and friendly outsourcing policies for multinationals have also helped Chile produce more low-skilled labor and reduce the income gap. This is the case for most Latin American countries, which benefit from the development of technology that increase the labor offerings for low-skilled workers and avoid the downfalls of development technologies that displace the middle-income class. At the same time, they benefit from income growth internationally by providing cheap sources of labor. The combination of these factors explain why the region has been seeing a decreasing trend in income gap. This is not to say that Latin America has avoided the pitfalls of economic growth in relation to income inequality, but rather that the full-blown effects have not been seen yet. The determinant factor for how well Latin American countries manage to handle economic growth will be the institutions built around them. A special concern should be given into access to education. Low-skilled workers that access education are able to develop skills that allow them to handle a potential replacement by technologic advancement. Equal access to quality education also helps to bridge the so-called digital divide and allows everyone to take advantage of technological developments in the same way. This is especially worrisome given that Chile has one of the lowest net spendings on education amongst developed countries. Additionally, the education gap amongst poor and rich people in Chile is especially worrisome. Free access to quality education has been in the forefront of debates in Chilean politics recently. Chile should ensure equal and free access to education for everyone in order to avoid the pitfalls of a widening income gap due to technologic development. Other policies that could be considered are migration. This is one of the policies that entails a double dividend as it reduces income inequality while at the same time boosting long-run GDP.